Hi, I'm Ann Gaviola. Welcome to The Peak on Global, where we break down what's trending in the business world and what you need to know to stay ahead of the curve. Joining me now is Brett Chang from The Peak Podcast. Welcome, Brett. Hey, Ann. Always great to be with you. Let's start with Canada's second quarter GDP, which grew at an annual rate of 3.3%. So it's sort of this good news, bad news scenario because it expanded. So that's the good news, but not by as much as the street expected and unlikely dipped into negative territory in July. What do you think of all this, Brett? Well, it's definitely not a good sign for Canada's economy at large. And it was to be expected. I think there were some hopeful analysts that thought that maybe it would exceed that 3.3% mark, but it just didn't hit it. And in fact, it's likely going to go into contraction now. And so this kind of just proves what we've been talking about for the past few weeks on this program, which is that it's likely that we're going to experience some type of economic downturn, maybe even a recession. Now it's just a matter of how deep or severe this recession will be. I think this is particularly interesting because this coming Wednesday, we'll have an interest rate announcement from the Bank of Canada. GDP is one of just many factors that it takes into consideration. And it looks like the smart money is betting on a 75 basis point hike, maybe even some language that references the risk of recession. Do you think that that might happen this time around? Well, both the Bank of Canada and the Federal Reserve have been very, very clear, which is eliminating inflation is their number one priority. And they're even willing to sacrifice some of the broader economy, whether that be small businesses or homeowners in order to do that. And so it's very likely that they're going to do a 75 basis point or even 100 basis point increase in interest rates as they continue to fight inflation. Okay, let's talk about this other fight that the central bank has on its hands. It's been, as you mentioned, busy trying to tame soaring inflation, of course, um, but also fighting a battle against misinformation online and one of its tools of choice, Twitter. I want to share a tweet with you from the Bank of Canada. It says, you asked us if we printed cash to finance the federal government. We didn't. This is followed by this lengthy thread laying out what it did to support the economy during the pandemic. What do you think of this, Brett? Well, it's a pretty interesting time for the Bank of Canada. They are at the forefront now of the broader kind of social conversation and monetary policy. It's not simple stuff. In fact, it's actually very complicated and requires a professional economist to manage it. And that's kind of what the Bank of Canada's role is, is that they have a number of economists working there full time who are trying to figure out the best way to manage our monetary supply. And one point of misinformation that's been spreading a lot, and by the way, some people would argue that this is not misinformation, it is contentious, is that the Bank of Canada was printing money in order to buy government bonds. So during COVID, they were almost bailing out provinces or providing them with additional liquidity to spend on COVID relief. And to do that, they were buying bonds on the open market. But the Bank of Canada, it really does struggle to find ways to communicate in simple terms exactly what they were doing. And this Twitter thread was their attempt at doing that and informing the public on what they're actually up to. Yeah, I don't remember learning very much about central banks in my earlier days in school. And I, I think generally they're pretty misunderstood. I think that leads to this, what we're seeing is a little bit of politicization in terms of what it is that the Bank of Canada is and does. And in terms of how they managed inflation and inflation expectations, I think a lot of people, I mean, you, they just don't even listen or, or maybe don't fully understand what's going on in this case. The bank talks about buying government bonds, as you mentioned, from banks in the open market. This brings down the cost of borrowing. It acted as stimulus for the economy. We all get that, right? So this is monetary stimulus. It's different from fiscal stimulus, which comes from the federal government and spending from those coffers, you know, adds to the deficit. In the case of the central bank, though, money created in a time of emergency can subsequently be withdrawn. I know it sounds like I'm talking about magic. I almost feel like I should put out an explainer video with graphics for this one. What do you think, Brett? Well, I think that's a great idea. So I think there's two things here, which is one, you mentioned that we weren't really taught about monetary theory for most of our lives. And our generation has been, it's been kind of absent from the educational curriculum. And the main reason why is that we really haven't had to deal with inflation. This is the first time in most of the millennial generation that we've ever had even had to think about inflation. And so it is currently at the forefront of our broader conversation. But the second thing is that this is probably a good thing. It's good that we are now more engaged in monetary policy. We should understand what's going on. It is fundamentally, there are politics involved in the decisions that the Bank of Canada is making. And I think the more people that are educated on this topic and informed on it, the better. And so I think it's great that the Bank of Canada is taking a more proactive stance and explaining what they do. I think that will help in building trust with the public, which will allow them and give them the permission to continue doing their job. And I also think it's good for the broader population to know exactly what's kind of going on with monetary policy, because it really does, as we're seeing now, impact our day-to-day -day lives. 
Right. And I should mention, these are unprecedented times. So, I mean, we could have learned about it in school, but the, the rules of the, the game have changed slightly. So there's a lot of kind of new information to, to take in. Let's also talk about, um, switching topics here, the luxury tax that came into being. Um, it's a new tax on expensive boats, cars, helicopters, private jets. But there is concern that even though it, it sounds like a good idea, it's probably not making a difference to the ultra-rich, uh, but instead wiping out or affecting jobs for everyday people. What do you think of this, Brett? Well, I think there's a bunch of ways to look at this. And depending on where you sit on the political spectrum, you'll have a different opinion on whether this is a good or bad policy. I guess the first thing to raise is that it really doesn't do much for the ultra, to the ultra rich. They continue to buy these types of luxury goods because they can afford to. And it doesn't really do much for the government coffers. The amount of money that this raises in terms of tax revenue is marginal. More what it's trying to do is send a message that if you are an ultra rich person in this country, that it's about time that you pay your fair share. And this is more of an aesthetic way of doing that than actually a kind of comprehensive solution to make tax reform more fair. So there's kind of that consideration as well. And then absolutely, as you mentioned, there's a number of different businesses, small businesses in Canada that are making and producing components or the full kind of vehicles or Rough goods boats. that this tax affects. Boats, yeah, planes, boats, luxury cars. And so that they're going to take a hit for sure. But I, I do think that if you look at it in macro, uh, this isn't going to be as big of an impact as many people think. Yeah, and I do take your point that sometimes with policy, it's not just what it does, it's the message that it sends out in terms of, you know, the collective thinks this is the right way to go about it. I do think it's interesting that the U.S. had a luxury tax years ago, and upon further examination, they decided to scrap it because of those unintended consequences. And I guess that's kind of the fine line. Where do you draw the line in terms of what you're hoping to accomplish and message and signal and what the real world impact is at a time when a lot of people, a lot of households are dealing with soaring inflation? Yeah, and, and you know, this is a very political issue and it's going to swing back and forth depending on who's in government and where their priorities lie. And so it's very easy to see how a different government might come into power and scrap this entirely because they ideologically are opposed to it. I think what we're going to see over time is that the longer this is there, uh, the less likely it is to be taken away. I think in the U.S. context, there was a change in Congress and they decided that this was no longer a priority or fruitful to them. And they heard from small business owners that were hurting and they made the decision that they wanted to prioritize that instead of uh, reorienting the tax code. And that's that's their prerogative. And that's kind of what governments are for. And that's why elections do matter. OK, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your time and your insight. Always a pleasure, Brett. Thanks so much, Anne. Enjoy the rest of your long weekend. And you can get all your daily business news with the Peak Daily Podcast. It's available for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you find your favorite podcasts.